Good morning and welcome to online worship at Richmond Hill United Church. Make yourself comfortable and be sure to get a candle if you don't have one already, because we'll be lighting it as part of the service in a few moments. Before we begin, I want to give a big thanks to Barb Cooper and to Craig Lee for today's duet. Thanks as well to all who support Richmond Hill United Church through PAR, by donating online through Canada Helps or by mailing in a check. These are challenging times for us all, which makes your continuing generosity so very meaningful. Generosity is one of the values that makes community possible. It is an outward sign of the love that we share for God, creation, our neighbors, each other. As a sign of our love, we kindle light. As we have kindled light here, I invite you to light your candle at home. The light that burns here and in all of our homes burns within each of us, holding us in love and inviting us to reach out in love to others. That same love calls us to live justly and so we acknowledge that we come together in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are called into a relationship of mutual respect, solidarity, and care. And we stand in solidarity as well with any who are hurt and excluded, committed to be a safer space for all, all races, cultures, orientations, ages, abilities, body types, genders, identities, histories, beliefs, and circumstances. Keno, willkommen, magandano maga. Friends, we come together as a community to worship and reflect together. We come joined in faith, upheld by hope, and supporting one another in love. Let us pray. Word of life, we have gathered today in a spirit of trust, grateful for your unfailing love and steadfast care. Open our hearts and minds to your wisdom, that reflecting on your word, we may discern our purpose and humbly walk in your way of peace. We pray with hearts open to holy wisdom. Amen. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to use our version of our opening hymn, uh, but I did find a version by Maxine and Allison from Westminster United Church in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. That's the power of the internet. So note, though, that tempo change after the first verse. So a big thanks to Humboldt, Saskatchewan, for Westminster United Church's version of Wisdom 7. It's found on Voices United, page 892, if you have a hymn book at home. It's, of course, found on your website uh, under hymns as well, if you want to follow the prayers and readings. Uh, of course, open up home prayers, and it'll all be written on your screen.
As we prepare to hear our readings today, let us pray this prayer of openness. Holy One, when Jesus asked his disciples, what are people saying about me? His inquiry surprises, at least until we realize it isn't about him, that he is getting them ready to name who he is to them. That feels risky to be put on the spot. And so when we are asked who he is, it is easier to stay quiet. When faith in him means sticking out our neck in defense in the vulnerable, it feels safer to do nothing. In a world where silence is complicity, forgive our closed lips. Help us to open our mouths, to speak up, to name hard truths. In the name of the human one, we pray. Amen. Our first reading is pivotal as Jesus invites his disciples to not only say what people are saying about him, but to affirm who they have come to believe he is, the affirmation of who the divine is and who we are in relation is the foundation of the Bible. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. Now when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the human one is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He said, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus replied, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my father who is in heaven has shown you. I tell you that you are Peter, and I'll build my church on this rock, the gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of, of heaven. Anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. Then he ordered the disciples not to tell anybody that he was the Christ.
Our next reading is an excerpt from Crow and the Weasel by writer and the environment mathematist Barry Lopez. The story is a mystical adventure of two young men seeking wisdom in a time when animals and the humans still spoke the same language. When they returned to their village, they share not only about their adventures, but what they learned about friendship, respect, and the importance of gratitude. I would ask you to remember only this one thing, said Badger. The stories people tell have a way of taking care of them. If stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them away where they are needed. Sometimes a people needs a story more than food to stay alive. That is why we put these stories in each other's memory. This is how people care for themselves. One day you will be good storytellers. Never forget these ob obligations. Unlike the last two weeks, today's word, well, it's not in our gospel reading, though it is present conceptually in much of it. Not surprising given that it is such an important word, concept really, factoring in so much of what Christians do. The word you may have guessed is Bible. I felt it was important to talk about this book before we move on to other words. It plays a big part as a source of the vision of God's reign that we heard a couple of weeks ago is foundational to the word Lord. People turn to the Bible as a way to nurture their faith. Plus the next words we'll be encountering are read through a lens in, of how people interpret various texts. So let's look at this word this concept, this book. Now I say book, but the Bible is really more of a library. This is important because a book is usually, well, one genre. The type of book influences how it is approached. It could be a novel, poetry, a history, a collection of legends. And the Bible is all of these and more. In it, there are genealogies and prayers, wise sayings and words of challenge. And that will impact how I experience the text. I read a psalm differently than a prophetic text. The context shapes my experience, as does when it was written and for whom. Is it a response to a situation like a letter? Or is it a reflection on an experience, like a gospel, written long after the events it refers to? In this regard, each gospel, though a narrative, isn't a biography, it's a theology. The particular gospel writer's answer to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Each gospel is a reflection on Peter's response. What they understand, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, to me. This is why the Bible has become so important to so many people. Across the whole library, you experience an evolving theology. The Old, or First Testament, an exploration by the tribes of Israel of who the living God is and how they are in a divine covenant. That aspect of covenant or relationship is also key to those of us who identify as Christian. The books of the New, 
Second Testament do more than outline Jesus' way, but explore who he is and, well, what it means not just to believe he's the Christ, but how we are changed by being in relationship with him. And like other sacred texts, the Bible has had both an individual and a communal impact. For generations, it's been experienced as a source of wisdom. And this is why we give it pride of place. The stories are a way of knowing both who we are and who we can be. And this is Barry Lopez's point about stories. They're a way in which we care for each other. They are a source of identity, both grounding us and pushing us. And so the Bible is like a cut gem. You come to a story one day and you see something. And then, well, you notice another facet the next time you look at the same story. The story hasn't changed, but you have. And what's going on in the world has changed as well. Through the Spirit, the Bible has been a medium by which we've been engaging in a dialogue with the one we call God and each other for millennia. In this, the Bible is a gift. And in this, the Bible is a challenge. Historically, we've given the Bible a lot of weight, especially as Protestants. And I wonder if sometimes maybe too much weight. I wonder if we've missed Luther's rally of sola scriptura, We've misused it because the saying was a critique of Catholic emphasis on church teaching known as capital T tradition, as well as the desire to get back to the core story rather than the layers of practice that have built up over generations and centuries. But just as our core story was obscured, I wonder if we have missed Luther's point and over time gone from meaning that the Bible should be a primary source for theological reflection to the Bible is the only authority. You see it when some want to treat it as a science textbook about the origin of the earth or a reliable history of Egypt and the Middle East miraculous sea crossings at all, even when archaeological evidence suggests contrary. The Bible didn't come down fully cooked out of heaven. It was compiled over generations. Is it inspired? I believe so. But it was still written by people. No wonder it contradicts itself so much. And yet, it is a source of wisdom but I don't feel it is exclusively so. I want to learn and grow from science and poetry and plays and novels and the scriptures of other faiths. Those are also sources of wisdom. Now, in the end, I take the Bible seriously, but not literally. A colleague likes to introduce the Bible this way. Now, whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. I love that because it invites me to engage the reading as a source of wisdom, whether it happened or not, to seek meaning especially as it applies in this particular moment. Because the Bible isn't static, it isn't fixed. Which is why we keep coming back to it. And as we have become ready to hear critiques in it that perhaps we weren't open to before. Say about sexism, or racism, or caring for the environment. In this way, I wonder if Luther's critique through the words sola scriptura, well, perhaps they were an overstatement. Roman Catholic teaching at its core is biblical, 
for example, Simon being named the rock, well, it's Catholic proof text for papal authority. We don't see the verse that way at all. We affirm Peter's role, but not as if he's given exclusive authority, and certainly not through a succession of popes. But the idea that tradition, well, it's an ongoing conversation with these sacred texts, these sacred stories. We all come to them differently, trusting in the guidance of the Spirit, the Spirit's insight. And like I said about faith, well, ideally we should debate them with each other and grow in the process. This, again, is a model we receive from Judaism. Torah plus the prophets and other writings, well, they comprise the Tanakh. But there's also the Talmud, made up of Mishnah, the written version of the Oral Law, and Gemara, the rabbinic discussion of that law. The Talmud is taken seriously as a source of wisdom. Unlike seeing the Bible as fixed, as unchanging, this approach recognizes that it is a source of understanding for each time at each place. We heard in our gospel that Peter and the church as a whole were given keys to both bind and loosen. Well, that's what the rabbis do when they debate the law. I wonder then, maybe if Jesus was making Peter chief rabbi, rather than a pope. Anyways, one of the differences between Catholics and Protestants is whether the emphasis is placed on the church or the Bible, each arguing that one gives rise to the other. Well, I argue it's a mutual birthing. The community writes down its story, and as it recalls its story, it is birthed anew. So you see, they really go together. A dialogue between people and the Bible and ultimately with God. So I vote that we keep going back to the Bible. Not as an unchanging, inerrant authority, but as a library of wisdom. Knowing that when we come to it with an open heart, when we read these stories in this way, they're sometimes more sustaining for us than food, uplifting our spirits and reminding us of both who we are and who we can be. Amen.
Let us pray. Living presence, as we come together to worship, we do so in humility, grateful for all that you do and are, embracing all that is in love and grace. It is with awareness of your mercy and care that we pause to pray. There are many concerns on our hearts, and so we stop now to name them in silence. We pause as well to pray for members of Richmond Hill United Church. We remember those who are grieving loved ones, facing serious life-limiting illness, those who are lonely, facing financial stresses, and other anxieties in this challenging time. We think especially of parents, children, teachers, early childhood educators, other school staff, facing uncertainty with the coming school year. Praying for this congregation is a reminder that we are not alone, but part of a wider faith community. We pray for the church as a whole, trusting Jesus promised to build it on the rock of faith. We know your spirit is amongst us, and so pray that all churches may be instruments of your love and compassion, especially those struggling in these unfamiliar times of online gatherings, physical distancing, and curtailed ministries. We recognize as well that your grace is wider than any one faith tradition and pray with Muslims around the world as they celebrate Muharram. We need to respond with arms open as wide as we can in these times of ongoing political uncertainty south of the border. But it's not just the U.S. We pray for Russia, Mali, Lebanon, Venezuela, this country as well. It feels like we are in tumultuous times everywhere. Economies in dire straits, famines, food scarcity, medical supply shortages, high unemployment, new spikes in the transmission of novel coronavirus. We hear as well with alarm about the loss of 28 trillion tons of ice across the globe in just 30 years. And yet, there is hope. Ongoing protests for racial justice. The naming of Canada's first female finance minister. Commitments to build back with green initiatives. These are just a few signs that a more just, inclusive, and sustainable world is possible. So be with us in your perseverance, your strength and courage, present calling us into your vision of love. Living one, trusting in the abiding presence of Jesus, we pray the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our concluding hymn is one for the child and all of us. Jesus loves me, this I know. Voices United, number 365, if you have a hymn book at home. And if you are using the hymn book, we're singing uh, two verses, verses one and three.
As our time of worship draws to a close, I invite you to join in our blessing. As we go forth from here, may we be strong in spirit, courageous in will, and gentle of heart. Each day may our actions be rooted in wisdom, nurtured by hope, and open to love. And may we meet others as we would wish to be met, with a heart of compassion and a spirit of healing and grounded in joy. So friends, our Zoom room remains open for those who would like to engage in a time of conversation and fellowship. And of course, I will see you online next Sunday.